like I'm doing. I'm packing. I can see that, but isn't it a bit soon for all this? Son, you better go back to bed and get some more rest. Your head's not working right yet. My head? You don't want that's up at five in the morning packing dishes. Mama, go. Oh, I'm sorry I woke you, Jean, but I've already packed up my bedroom and you and Jimmy were in yours. You want to hand me some more of that newspaper over there? Mm. Oh, I just couldn't get to sleep. I'm so excited about moving into our new house. Correction. Old house. Mama, I know you're excited and all, but this is a bit ridiculous. I mean, we just signed the escrow papers just yesterday. Now, it's going to take a couple of months before oh, the loan Jean. is approved. Oh, Jean, don't even think like that. Besides, Leon said... Yeah, that... I, I can't help what Leon said. I know about these things, Mama. It takes time. It takes time for the application and the, the clearance and all that stuff to clear. And there's a lot of paperwork oh. to be signed. The attorneys and appointments oh, and all. But, Jean, well, Leon listen. said... Leon I said... Mama... I don't care what Leon said. He got us into this situation, but even Leon can't speed up the process. Now, come on. Now, I spoke to Leon last night, and he said he think he can pull a few strings. Oh, and... sure, and Leon's one that brought you all these boxes, too, huh? Well, yes, he did, and he said there's plenty more if we need any. Oh, mm, gosh, I don't believe this. We haven't even bought the house, and you and Leon already got us moved into it. Gee, we have to be prepared any day now, any day. Sure, Mom, sure, Oh, sure, sure, you'll sure. see, son, you'll see. Mm -hmm. How about some coffee? Well, you probably already have the cups packed, too. I'm prepared. Good morning, sleepyhead. I thought I was going to have to call you again. I don't know if I'm getting older or these mornings are just coming quicker. Only because your nights are getting longer. You got in late again last night. Ah, uh, yeah. Hey, speaking of last night, are you okay? Fine. You sure freaked out on me last night. I mean, you, maybe you should see Dr. Greeley. Oh, I admit it was silly of me to lose control like that. But I am fine now. Let's get back to you and Julie. Oh, we went for pizza. The car broke down. Sorry. You know how I feel about you staying out late on a school night. And you know your father wouldn't like it either. Well, he'd understand. Anybody can have a broken water hose. Well, that's true. But it's happened several times lately. And you do have a curfew. Curfew? Come on, Mom. I'm too old for that now. I bet you I'm the only guy that Julie's ever dated that has a curfew. Peter. She does have a nice personality, huh? Yes, she does. And I'm glad I finally got to meet her. Wish Dad could have met her. You've been spending a lot of time after work with Julie lately, haven't you? Yeah, I guess I have. In fact, every time you've been coming home late, you've been out with her. Come on, Mom. Trust me, would you? I mean, I know we're out late, but we're not doing anything, anything wrong. I'm not implying that you are, Peter, but one thing can lead to another. Now, you invite trouble when you break a curfew, or when you make it a habit of bringing a girl alone into an empty house. Mom, we were waiting for our ride. Well, there is no harm Dad in told me that I should bring her over to meet the family. Julie is welcome here any time you like, as long as I am here. Well, you can even invite her to dinner. Now, hold it. You're telling me I can, I can bring a girl over just so you're in the house? You read me loud and clear. Well, thank you for the vote of confidence. Now, before you get angry with me, you think about what your father would say. He'd agree with you. He'd say, Peter, it doesn't look good. You're inviting trouble. 
You know, Mom, <laughs> being mature and responsible, it's not too easy, is it? No, Peter, it isn't. Webster, you use one of these things? Well, who are you, Smokey the Bear? No, oh, it's too bad. A lot of people can't. Fire is a dangerous thing. It kills people. Look, can I help you, or you just want a light for that cigarette? No, I don't smoke. Look, uh, why don't you come back uh, when my secretary gets in? It'll be about half an hour. Well, I don't want to talk to her. Or better yet, uh, why don't I recommend a new lawyer to you? There's a good one across the street there, Miller. He's pretty good. Uh, he's not uh, Charles Carpenter's attorney. <sighs> okay, who are you? Well, <laughs> I'm a fire distinguisher. Bradford Slate, arson investigator. Uh, look, I'm a busy man, Mr. Slate. Look, why don't you uh, make an appointment with my secretary, okay? It won't take long. I want to ask you one question. Are you going to be as evasive with me as your client was? Okay. You got five minutes. But I don't have time for you to play deputy dog, barking up the wrong tree. I'm sure Mr. Carpenter told you everything he knows. Now, why do you guys insist on running everything into the ground? Well, you know what they say, where there's smoke, there's oh, fire. Oh, please. You got one question or five minutes, whichever comes first. Shoot. Well, you know, for 15 years, I've been tromping around fires to make a living. And I found out that uh, you learn to ask for certain things. You, you, you learn to look at certain things real close. Good for you. Four minutes. Well, uh, my, my uh, sources have informed me that there was a man coming in and out of this office all the time the day before the fire. <laughs> Real smart sources you got there. About 30 years old, six foot tall, dark complected, black hair, wore a mustache, good six feet. Uh, you remember him? Well, let me think. Uh... No, I, I don't think so. It kind of sounds like city manager Owens, though, doesn't it? But he hadn't been over here for a couple of months anyway. No, oh, I think your sources must be mistaken. I don't think so. Well, who is this guy anyway? The arsonist. Arsonist? Look, that Hollister fire was a classic case of arson, and I happen to know you and Carpenter were involved. Careful, Slate. You know, you can be sued for libel for remarks like that. And you, Mr. Webster, can be charged with homicide. Thanks for your time. I don't want any lectures or advice, Alex. I'm fine. Yeah, but, Terry, you're doing the same thing I did when Ellen died. What do you mean? You're burying yourself in your job, and you're shutting out your friends, even your family. You're withdrawing into your own safe little world where you don't have to face that reality that you're afraid and lonely. You're wrong, Alex. Then why do you walk around in a half daze wearing a, a fake smile on your face? You know, Terry, you and I used to be able to talk. Now all we do is converse. Just because I don't discuss my problems with you doesn't mean I've withdrawn. That's true enough. But, but do you discuss them with anyone else? Or do you just ignore them, hoping they're going to go away? Uh -uh. Oh, no, Terry. Well, that's not going to work. Now, you're only hurting yourself, and you're worrying your friends. My friends have nothing to worry about because I don't have any problems. But, Terry, you just admitted that you did. Look, what about... What about... Missing Scott and trying to put the pieces of your life back together. And there's the same with Nancy, your finances, Peter. Okay, okay. Then you admit that you're withdrawing. Alex, I don't know. Terry, now you promise me that you'll think about what I've said here today, okay? I've been there. I know how you feel. Okay, Alex. Okay. I'll think about it. You got, look, you'll, you'll never guess who uh, paid me a visit this morning. <laughs> no, uh, 
A fat fire chaser. Yes, yeah, Slate. Oh, look, this guy is a live wire. I, I, I thought you said that you'd taken care of him. Well, look, he's bad for business, George. Yeah, this afternoon? Okay, good. Yo, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, yeah. bye. Mr. Webster. Now listen to me, Dunbar. Don't you come barging into my office once again without knocking, or I'm gonna... Or what? You gonna slap a restraining order on me? That seems to be a specialty these days. And you and your client seem to have a propensity for violating them. Well, when I had my say, I... I expect that our legal paths won't cross very much anymore. Well, in that case, please have a seat. I certainly uh, wouldn't want to see a man who is about to admit defeat standing on his feet. <laughs> well, then you better sit right out and down again. We're not about to compromise, Counselor. I think my client, Ms. Uh, Lawson, has made it clear what she wants from both the Lindsay and Davidson estates. Well, what she gets and what she wants are far cry from each other. Webster, did you know that Nancy is not Nora's real daughter? You're just finding that out. Oh, you knew that. My client has been honest with me. Well, did you also know that Nancy was never legally adopted by Nora? Counselor, you seem to forget that we have a will in which Nora left most of her estate to Nancy. <laughs> a phony will. Oh, but you probably knew that, too. Probably drew it up in the first place. Now, Dunbar, I'm not going to take much more of your mouth. Well, now, let me tell you that my client, Terry Davidson, and her children are not going to take any more Nancy charades. Oh, come on, Webster, you don't have a case. It's over. Why don't we just let a judge decide that? That, that would be fine. Just fine. I'd like nothing better than to go into court and to prove that Nancy is a, a fraud, a liar, a thief, an extortionist. To say nothing of tampering with uh, safety deposit boxes. Oh, you both could do quite a bit of time in prison for that one. I'll uh, take this new information to my client. Possibly she might want to settle out of court. It just might be too late for that, Webster. Have a good day. Hey. Dave, how are you? I'm fine, other than the cold. Good. How are you doing? I'm okay. What can I help you with? Well, would you believe I just came to browse around, see how you were doing? Ow, oh, look at all these Bibles. <laughs> Good night. Looks like you took me seriously the last time I was in. So many of them? Yeah, I, I didn't know there were so many versions. So, how are they selling? Uh, I sold one to myself. Hey, you don't sound too happy. What's the matter, business slow? I get the customer, I just can't... Keep them, I scare them away. Oh? Well, I've been kind of over-enthusiastic, see? Everybody that comes in the door, I want to witness to them. Uh, about the love of the Lord, whether they want to hear it or not. <laughs> uh, so far, I've been striking out with about everybody. Hey, you know, when you talked to me, it was at the right time. It was the time I needed to hear it. Maybe what you'd have to do is just uh, consider the right time and place. Sure. I, uh, I don't know, Dave. Something's wrong. The bookstore's not making me as happy as I thought it would. See, I thought that's what God wanted for us. Hmm. Well, you know, Jeff, maybe, uh, you just convinced yourself that that's what God wanted for you because you wanted it so badly. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if that's true, though. I really blew it this time. Why? Well, because Liz and I have put every cent we own into this place. I mean, who's going to buy it now? Hey, wait a minute. Let's drop the bookstore for a minute. Why don't you just tell me what you really want to do? Well, it keeps crossing my mind all the time. I, I, I try to get it off my mind and out of my heart. The ministry, right? How do you know? <laughs> it's just a suspicion, that's all. I keep telling myself it's impossible. I mean, I've got the bookstore and I've got my family. Possible. Okay. Hey, I'm the former alcoholic, remember? 
Now, impossible is an interesting word, but, uh, you know, somehow I don't think that's part of God's vocabulary. By the way, weren't you the guy who uh, had terminal cancer? <laughs> <laughs> right. Send him in. Hello, Bradford. It's been a while. Not since the condo fire. About four months. Six? Ah, who's counting? Have a seat. I've been hearing some pretty impressive things about you lately from the county sheriff. Oh. Well, just trying to do a job. I suppose you want to know why I'm calling you in here today. Well, you don't call me very often. <laughs> Only when it's important, and I think the Hollister Square fire probably qualifies. Well, where there's smoke. Clever. As you're probably aware, there's going to be a shopping center constructed on that site. Yes, sir. And uh, your cooperation in this investigation will be benefit to all of us. Well, this is a high priority case. As a matter of fact, I've been investigating and found there's a possibility of arson here. Well, you need to be very sure in this case. Uh, I don't want a shadow of a doubt in the whole thing. What kind of evidence do you have? Well, we know the point of origin of the fire was in uh, Dr. Ben Martin's office. Uh, flammable liquid, possibly gasoline, was uh, poured out on the, at that location. A doctor's office. I think doctor's offices usually have bottles of alcohol and other combustible fluids laying around. Maybe the good doctor was uh, negligent. You know, a bottle could explode, fall over during the fire, and this could spread it. It was all due to maybe faulty wiring. Well, possibly, but uh, I, I've checked these pretty closely, and it, it doesn't... Anything really... else? Well, yes, uh, Dr. Martin had a very suspicious patient uh, the day before the fire, and I suspected that uh, possibly he was uh, casing the place. Well, you can't prove that unless you've got a witness that uh, puts the possible arsonist at the site of the fire. Well, there were no eyewitnesses, but uh, no I No witnesses? Feel... No evidence? Well... We know that Charles Carpenter had a strong motive for seeing that building burn. <laughs> and Harold Webster is his attorney. That's very dangerous talk, Bradford. I think if this case drags on any further, the county might be sued for harassment. And I don't think you have a case. There's an old man that died in this fire. Who's to say that he didn't start the fire himself with a, a cigarette or a, a pipe? I think we ought to just drop the investigation altogether for the sake of all concerned. Commissioner, I believe it. Immediately, Bradford. <laughs> Understand? If you say so, sir. If you say so. Yeah, it's Gina. Not right now. Uh, the name's Peter Davidson, right? Yeah, you remembered. Not quite, but I will. These have your name on them. Yeah. Yeah, these are very important papers for my uh, company. I'm sure. Uh, you know, I'm Mr. Prescott's right-hand man. He sends me on all his uh, important assignments. After I get my engineering degree, I'll be a uh, construction foreman. It's good. Uh, when will you graduate from college? Well, it's going to be a while, see. I'm going to have to go part-time. Uh, well, with all my present workload and responsibilities. And I know stuff. what you mean. I thought I would never graduate. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, I would be coming in here pretty regularly. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, maybe if sometime you had the time, maybe we could uh, go out for dinner or something. Or lunch. Or you know, as soon as I get my carpet. Well, Peter, I don't know. I, I would have to... Hey, Peter! Hey, I thought you'd be in here. I saw your truck out front. Yeah, I was just in here picking up Vicky. I mean, uh, these permits. 
Yeah, well, uh, according to the message I heard coming from your truck radio, you're supposed to pick up a loaf of bread with a gallon of milk from Mr. Prescott's secretary by 4.30. I'm sure that, that call was from somebody else. And, well, the dispatcher mentioned your name correctly, or at least close to it, unless there's a Paul Davidson who works for Prescott. Mm. New dispatch. Mm. Yeah, I better check this out. Uh, thanks a lot, Gene. Uh, I mean, Vicky. And thank you. Okay, you guys. Peter, come on. Peter. Sorry. It's okay, man. Bye-bye. Here. <laughs> oh, Peter, don't be late again tonight. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. 